Good morning. I'd like to welcome all those who are joining us here in the sanctuary and also those online. Uh, my name is Judy Guy. I am the chair of the deacons here at Freehold First Baptist. And uh, after a thunderous night, I think the sun is coming out, so I'm glad you're all here, able to join us. I'd also like to welcome Reverend Hugh McKenzie, who is back for a second time with us. Uh, he's here with his lovely wife, Jackie. And as Becky Bennett said a few weeks ago when Reverend McKenzie was here, please don't ask him any stories about me because I've known him for about 40 years and you don't want to know. <laughs> so, having said that, please, if, um, you would rise. Oh, I'm sorry, Olivia Dixon, please come up for the call to worship, the choral call to worship. Thank you, Olivia and Jen. Now, if you would all please rise as you're able and join me in this morning's call to worship. Sing praises to God, all you faithful ones. God hears us in our fear and our sorrow. Where there was no way, God now leads us in a new way. Where there was no mercy, Where there was weeping, and now if you remain standing for our first hymn, also found in your bulletins, "Come, ye faithful, raise the strain."
I don't know the custom, rise, shall you, or shall you be seated? Well, you're standing, let's remain standing. The opening scripture is from Psalm 40. It says the little asterisk there, what's the matter with me? Which says, on your feet. See, I'm, I'm rusty, Judy. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't hold it against I me. I didn't see that after. Anyway, Psalm 40, 1 through 5. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise of our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Amen. None, I have a couple. The ladies' Bible study will meet tomorrow morning at 10. Uh, our Wednesday evening Bible study will meet this Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. This study will be featuring Adam Hamilton's book, The Lord's Prayer. If anyone wants to join this session, please contact Jennifer so she can order you the materials. There will be a deacon's meeting immediately following the worship. And I would like to thank our music ministry intern, Olivia, for being our soloist this morning, while the choir, get, choir gets a much deserved vacation. And I believe that's it. And now it's time for our children's moment. Do we have any children who are willing to come forward? Ah, there's a candidate. And I guess we, where do we sit, over here? Right over there, young man. I learned my lesson the last time, from last time. Um, what is your name? Oscar. Oscar, okay. Um, I pastored in Maryland for a while, and um, it was the pastor's first or second citrus story, the first or second you know there was a big, this is not the children's service, this is for the uh, children in the audience. And um, I storm. And it was the pastor, the organist, and the closest farmer, whose farm was dairy farm, who was right at the edge of town. And so the pastor stands up and he does the whole service as if there were people there. And uh, goes to the back after the doxology and shakes hands with the one congregant. And he asks the farmer, well, what did you think, Jess? And Jess said, well, I'm a dairy farmer, as you know, and if only one cow showed up for the feeding, I wouldn't feed him the whole side. For <laughs> last week's hour and a half, you don't have to suffer. These are 
from Sanibel in Florida for those reasons. And you hopefully it'll be a, a memory game for what we're about to tell you. Another true story. Under three minutes. So you you're too young to play hooky from school, right? Oh, oh. <laughs> Some of you have done that, I'm sure, if you can remember. Anyway, no play hooky, but they couldn't stay in town, so they went to the next county up and went to the beach where they weren't familiar. Now, these uh, two people, young people, boy, girl, young man, young, young woman, were on the swimming team. And uh, they looked over, and everybody was kind of looking around to see what to do. And across a small inlet, like a mass one, was the beach that they wanted to go to. So these two wise guys, instead of walking all the way around the side of the swim across, well, they kind of looked at the side. You know what a rip tide is or a rip current? It's a current right under the water that's very powerful. You don't notice it until you did it. Well, they go right in to a rip tide. And they swam and they swam. And they, so it was only maybe, I don't know, 300 yards, which is what, three football, football fields? And it was right where they wanted to go, it was right in the back of a boy that was listening to the dog. And before they knew it, the boy was behind them. And they were swimming, swimming, swimming. Two and one half hours later, they were about two miles out to sea. And they were starting to get cold. I guess, yeah, about two hours later, it's the length of the sermon. So, <laughs> There's nobody around and the weather was turning cloud. Now here's the other half of the story. There was a guy from Jersey who took advantage of uh, working from his computer and took his 45 foot yacht down to, uh, well, it was clear what, I don't know. But he started to work from his boat. But his boss said, you better get back up to Jersey uh, on a certain date. He and three fans, friends got in the boat and they got right outside the inlet and the boats sprung in. They had to go back, it was delayed. Okay, they got that out of there and then they went out again and went about two miles to another place and the engine almost died and it was algae, it was a diesel engine, it was algae, yeah, it went three months because he had to run the engine. What a year. He lost another day. So on day three, he said, I've only got so much time. So he was two days late on the third day, and the weather turned. And instead of going where he was supposed to go, the wind pushed him in to his inlet. And somebody, they were playing loud music, and the wind was falling. Somebody said, did you hear that? No. They turned around, and there were the two young people waving and screaming. And they were about to go down at the third time. They were bluer than blue. And they took him on board the boat. Guess what the boat's name was? Amen. <laughs> Amen. And the young lady got on, on board the boat and she said, God is real. Then the young man got on the boat and he said, I'm driving to the True story. So, listen to your parents, watch out for riptides, don't cut. Let's have a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the fact that you are in control even when it doesn't look like it is. That you are in control. We thank you that you always work things out in the end. And for that, we can rest assured that you love us. Amen. Thank you, Oscar. Remember me next time you go down the clear wall. Okay. Watch out for those great times. Thank you, Reverend McKenzie and Oscar. That may have been one of the few times that Reverend McKenzie listened to me and kept something short and, <laughs> and sweet. Thank you. You want to know what? No. <sighs>
Okay, do we have any uh, prayer concerns at this time? Yes, sir. Yes, Anne. Um, Sophie, she's husband Ray is having heart surgery on Thursday. Yes, uh, Sue's husband, Sue Beach's husband Ray is having surgery this week, so we ask for prayers for him. Any else? Any more else? Any more from the congregation? I'm sorry, the glare from the windows in the back, I can't see. Is it Chuck? Yes. Um, I found out this week that uh, Mary's sister. All I heard was Mary and complications. Miriam's sister, Mary Dell, um, got a diagnosis of breast cancer this week. And so she's having a consultation with the surgeon on Tuesday to find out what the cancer is. Okay. Miriam's sister, Mary Dell. Mary Dell is having, uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer and she's having a consultation this week, so please, prayers for her. Anyone else? Yes, I got some bad news uh, last night from uh, my Carolina uh, relatives that uh, my niece, Leanne, lost her daughter, 17 years old, in a car accident yesterday, uh, coming home from a violin lesson in the car hydroplane, and uh, she died instantly. So uh, pray for Luann and Bella, what's her name, and Jackie and I have to get down there. Pray for travel mercies for us as well. And now let us bring our concerns to God in this time of silent prayer. Lord God, we turn to you in this sacred place. Sometimes we do not wait patiently for you. Sometimes the events of life overtake us. Lord, help us to continually incline our concerns and our cries to you. Let us be, is, let us be as intentional with you as you are with us. Sometimes we find ourselves in the desolate pit, or as the psalmist says, the miry bog, sinking, sinking. But Lord, we ask that you would show us the way to stability and the truth that lies beyond the river but accompanies us throughout our days. For Lord, when we look back upon our lives, we see that you have multiplied more than you have subtracted. Our thoughts cannot grasp your love, your grace, for we all are sinners in need of grace. And when it comes, sometimes we don't even notice it. But Lord, we must tell and bear witness to the fact that you are love and that you are concerned even with the sparrow that falls to the earth. So Lord, hear our prayers. You have heard the concerns of this congregation. We place them at the altar of your loving action. 
In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture lessons are from the unfortunately obscure book of Nehemiah, which is quite a page turner. And um, I'm going to be reading selections from the third chapter. And I'll explain the context of it as we get into the sermon. But this is about building walls. The exiles have come home, and they realize they are in Fort Apache without the walls. And something must be done before they are overcome by those people who have come in for the last 70 years and have taken over Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah, being the great administrator that he is, comes up with this solution. He told each family to build what was in front of them. And so they did. Elias Abib, the high priest and his fellow priests, went to work and quickly rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the 100, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Heniel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built them as well. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah, and they laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars back in place. Mermoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section and the next section and the next section. And before anyone knew it, the wall was rebuilt. And then reading from the Gospel according to Mark, which is in your bulletin, Mark 4, 30 to 32. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? Why, it is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all seeds upon the earth, and yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I invite the ushers to come forward to accept our tithes and offerings.
one thing they taught me in seminary that I remember to this day, don't foul up the collection. <laughs> I stand before you chastised. Let us pray, uh, pray the prayer of dedication and we will use as a prayer of dedication after I say a few words, the Lord's Prayer, which I also miss. Thank you, Jackie, for that. Let us pray. Lord God, we ask you to send these gifts, the gifts and tithes of our hearts and our hands. Send them where we cannot go doing things that we have not yet dreamt of. All in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then please remain standing and let us sing, I Come to the Garden Alone. Thank you. Jesus. be seated and now we will have a solo I hope
Now, the last time I was here, we left the Judeans on the way to exile. And remember, looking at the imprecatory psalm, that means there's nothing good or positive in this psalm, where one of the exiles, the psalmist, said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We hung up our lyres, our stringed instrument upon the willows there. That would be almost three full generations before the Judeans came back from Babylon as predicted by Jeremiah. And it was terrible because they knew they had placed themselves there by not following the ways of their forebears. They just had not. And here they were for 73 years in a strange land. And the last time I was here, I tried to tie in their cultural confusion with the culture, cultural confusion that is happening to us here and now. Who would have thought that we would have the very foundations of what it means to have a Christian culture blown away in such a short time? Gender up for grabs, patriotism suspect, political competitors now evil enemies to be destroyed, and political discourse shouting past each other and not really exchanging ideas and perhaps above all else, religion on the wane. What's the individual to do? Indeed, what can one person do in the face of all this flux and change? Well, let's get the exiles home and then we can see what indeed Father God was up to and perhaps extract some principles for this very, very troubled time. Let us pray for illumination. Lord God, we come before you blind as it was to the facts at times, give us vision. Deaf at times to what you are trying to tell us, make us to hear. Lord, give us what we have not, which is complete faith in you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now, it's not apparent to us from this long range of time, generations upon generations, that there was an embedded truth to these exiles. And the truth was that they were the cream of Judean society. These exiles were the elite who kept things running in the old Judean, well, you couldn't call it an empire, but kingdom. The king's court for one, the priests and the temple personnel for another one, administrators both public and secular. These exiles soon proved their worth to the Babylonian empire, much in the manner of Joseph. Do you remember him? He of the coat of many colors, whose basic skills propelled him in Pharaoh's court to become the vizier or the actual prime minister of that massive Egyptian empire. And so it was here. The cream rose to the top again. Daniel, what a marvelous and mysterious book it is. But he became the advisor and the royal prophet to Nebuchadnezzar. Nehemiah, he became the royal cupbearer, the trusted advisor. And Ezra, part of the advisory council to the new empire under Cyrus the Great. Now, Nehemiah used his personal relationship with the king, some would say abuse, to return to Jerusalem on a scouting mission. What he didn't tell his king was that he was going to bring with him a good portion of the exiles from Babylon. The king probably knew exactly what was going on, but really didn't care because he needed his trusted man in this fractious part of his empire. The king wanted eyes on the ground, as it were, people he could trust, people he could communicate with. And so, as Jeremiah had predicted 70 years before in Jeremiah 25, 11, they returned. But it wasn't a joyous homecoming, that's for sure. What a mess they found. 
beautiful Jerusalem with a jewel in the center, the temple had become a desolation of wild animals. Lamentations. Don't read Lamentations if you're depressed. How deserted lies the city, so once full of people. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. And after much affliction and hard labor, Judah itself has gone into exile. Lamentations 1, 1, and 2. On top of the ruins that they saw before them, a new set of people had come in, pagans, foreigners, who now ironically resented the return of these rightful owners. The old timers had become strangers in their homeland. The exiles very quickly realized that they needed walls to protect that they needed walls to protect what was left of their people and their legacy and ultimately the temple they chose to rebuild. One of my favorite poets because it sounds odd, he was a poet of few words, Robert Frost said this, oh my goodness, about 80 years ago, walls make for good neighbors. Well, we can see that in our own time where the southern porous border continues to degenerate and now it's even spread to the Canadian border. They needed a wall, so do we. But Nehemiah uses the king's name to buy himself some time, but the fact remains that they were defenseless the walls were down, the gates were down. And frankly, before the king finds out what his cupbearer is really up to, he needs to act and act quickly. So he comes up with an expedient plan, a brilliant plan, in which he assigns notable families and even guilds like the priests and the pottery makers the job of rebuilding what was in front of them. Perhaps only 25 feet of wall, perhaps several hundred feet. But the work was commenced. For example, Eliashib, the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate, which was one of the main entrances to the old city. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah, and they laid the beams and put the bolts in the doors back in place. And the repairs were made by the Levites under Rehum, the son of Bani. And so it went, and so it went. But it wasn't that easy. Because you see, when the local leader of the folks who had moved in around Jerusalem, Rune Sanabat, heard what was going on, he was, according to chapter 4, verse 1, angry and greatly, highly incensed. How dare you? But note, by the way, the job was made easier. Why? The foundations were still in place of the wall and even of the temple itself. And the rubble was all about them, the rubble to rebuild what was before them. But the opposition was strong and plotted to attack. And Nehemiah heard about it, and here's what he came up with. Nehemiah 4, 16. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. He also quite literally over and over dropped the king's name with all the local politicos. And thus, in a few short weeks, a substantial, if not a very pretty barrier, was in place. And for the time being, they had their safety from which came their identity. And on top of all this, a little side note, as it were in chapter 5, Nehemiah and Ezra had found time to administrate the alms that they were collecting for the poor in their midst. Okay, nice story, exciting story. I wonder when Hollywood will get a hold of this. They tried it back in the 50s and it was a bomb. But at any rate, what are the applications? What can we draw from this? What, pray tell, does it have to say to us 2,000, 3,000 years later? Merely this. Think small. I know it's counterproductive, counterintuitive, rather, but think small. Keep it local. And above all else, do not despair because the foundations are still intact, begging to be built on. In other words, remember Robert Schuller, the Crystal Cathedral? Remember that? He was big in the 70s and 80s. Crystal Cathedral is still there, but now it's the headquarters of that particular Catholic diocese. But I'll never forget 
I sent in my obligatory $10 and got a pen back. And in the pen was a small seed, which I'll get to later, with the phrase, bloom where you are planted. Set your sights on what is before you and prayerfully go to work, never losing heart, because our God is bigger than any of our individual problems and cultural malaise. Use this as a thought experiment. Take a blank sheet of paper and draw two or three spaced circles on it, like, I don't know, the rings of Saturn. And dead center in the middle of the inner ring, draw yourself. Now with my skills, it ended up being a stick figure, but that's me. Then in the first circle, immediate around your figure, place the names of people who come, you come into contact frequently, like your spouse, your close family, your extended family. And then work your way out to people you see frequently, but not every day, who are not as important to your daily life, but you still come in touch with them. Work your way outward until you have those folks you have contact with, even less so, maybe weekly or monthly. You get the idea. Now, draw a line from these individuals back to you. Even if you're retired, or I love that old song, don't get around much anymore, I think you will be amazed at how many people you do touch daily, weekly, monthly, and so on. And by the way, if the contacts are few and far between, remember this from Proverbs 27, 17. Iron is made sharp by other iron, and people are made sharp by other people. And in this age of rapid and varied communication, take advantage of all the electronic communications we have before us Phones, emails, texting, and yes, for we, absolute dinosaurs. You know what's highly effective? A handwritten note. A handwritten note. Some people may say, what is this? But it's very effective, I find. You see, we need to, in Paul's words, have a body mentality with our sisters and brothers in Christ. And that's from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Just as a body, though one has many parts, Paul writes, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with the Christ. You see, body life is binding. And when we are in a body moving in the same direction under the aegis of Jesus Christ, not even the gates of hell will prevail against us. But one must be faithful. One must be attentive to one's surroundings. And above all else, one must be be intentional. These contacts are put there for a reason, for you to serve them and for them to serve you. When you are looking, walking through life rather, looking for opportunities to bear witness to Jesus Christ, believe me, amazing things happen. President George H.W. Bush, what number is he, 40 uh, scholars, 41 to not, not W, his father, H.W. Doesn't matter. We know he was president back then. Anyway, at the convention where he accepted the nomination of his party, he gave a speech, I don't know if you remember it, a thousand points of light. Kind of hokey and kind of corny, but I guess they had candles or lights or whatever. And it was quite beautiful. He was a bit of a romantic, but you know, it still works. A thousand points of light. Let me tell you about a dear friend of mine. He believes in a thousand points of light. He's the greeter, no, not at Walmart or Costco, but he's the greeter at a very, very large uh, institution. He's probably watching, so I don't want to give too much away. But every person, he's at the front desk, every person who comes through the doors, he prays for. And he has developed a small ministry that's getting bigger every time he gets the opportunity, perhaps weekly, I forget now. He writes a small uh, commentary on a particular verse that comes to mind, and he emails it out. A thousand points of light. Who knows what kind of influence he is having through the word of God on all of these people. Now, I'm going to use the term 
which I do not like. I'm going to hold my nose and say the word influencer. Ugh. But you know what? Every single one of us is an influencer at the center of a beautiful, remember Charlotte's Web? A beautiful Charlotte's Web of interaction and love. The wall got built around Jerusalem in record time, record time and note out of the rubble of the old city of broken dreams on the foundations of the law, scattered about on the ground, but reformed and rebuilt by hope-filled, believing people who believed that united, they were strong. Now surely each one of us, no matter what our age or circumstance, has something to give through contacting other people. We need each and every one of us to be godly influencers and to bloom where we are planted. Now I have a dear friend who passed on about, I must tell you exactly, seven years ago. And Eugene and I had a bit, he was a fellow pastor. We're Cal we were Calvinists, we are, I'm a Calvinist, he has passed on of course. But we believe that holy places are important, but don't get excited. We don't even know where Calvin is buried. That's how much we take that uh, belief on. So we made a bet with each other that sooner or later one of us was going to give in and take advantage of one of these offers that they often give pastors. Bring 15 of your congregation and we'll show you all over Israel. Well, I never had the desire, but Eugene did. And the son of a gun owes me a crab dinner down at Hausner's, which he'll never repay me now because he's with the Lord. But you know what he said? He said, I hate to tell you, Mac, because you're going to laugh at me. But it was one of the most transforming experiences of my life. He said, yeah, I mean, there were people that tried to take advantage of us. Like the guy, when he went up to Galilee, said, Mr., I can take you out in a boat to where Jesus walked down the water. Think about it. Anyway, he said, but the same guide showed us the traditional spot of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, it's a natural amphitheater that can hold thousands. It's on a ridge and the amphitheater faces the beach, as it were, to the Galilee, just like in the scriptures. And he said, but the one thing that struck his eye, struck his eye, was the fact that there were shrubs all over the amphitheater. And guess what they were? Mustard bushes. And he said, that came home to me so powerfully that the mustard, the words of Jesus, that the mustard seeds are the tiniest of all seeds. But when they take hold, they have these massive shrubbery, almost tree-like bushes in which the birds of the air make their nests. Take that seed that is your intentionality to be Jesus' person in the place that he has planted you and plant it, not in yourself, but in other people. And again, the gates of hell shall not prevail. And the people said, Amen. Oh, you're Baptist. Amen. 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 Pretty bad when a Presbyterian has to teach about amen. Now, let me check very carefully so I don't mess this up. I am dyslexic, by the way, in my own defense. Uh, just ask my wife when I drive on sidewalks, but that's another. Huh? Anyway, I believe we are now having the hymn, When We Walk With the Lord or Trust and Obey, one of my favorites. So please rise for that.
sacred place that Jesus precedes you, follows you, is on either side of you, even under your feet as you walk. But most importantly, Jesus walks in your heart. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.